goodness. Thank you. I just almost forgot. There we go. Now we're recording. So, um, but uh, I will I will uh, work out problems like I would in a, in a normal class. I'll walk you through them. Uh, the uh, the PowerPoint though is not a substitute for coming to lecture. Uh, I will record all the lectures as I do them. So if something comes up, you can go back and review them or if you miss them, that's only going to be while we're virtual. I don't have the ability to do that when we're live. But uh, as I was saying, though, the uh, um, PowerPoints are skeletons of what I'm going to talk about. So there might just be a few concepts on there and they'll expand on those during lecture. So again, if you just download those there, they may be cryptic and um, not really make a lot of sense unless you attend the lecture also. Okay, so let's start with the PowerPoint. And I plan to start to jump right into lecturing, uh, mainly because there's so much material for dynamics. Uh, I, if you haven't had me for instructor before, I, I taught statics for uh, since 2015. I've been at Cal Poly since 1999, and uh, I've taught a lot of different classes. This is my first time teaching dynamics, um, so I spent quite a bit of time um, I spent quite a bit of time over the break uh, getting ready for this, but I will say that it, it's a different beast than statics. It's a little bit more challenging. And so um, I will say that uh, the class itself is, uh, you know, you have to keep up with it. And so the, the, the emphasis I'll say is don't wait until uh, Sunday night to do the homework. Uh, you want to, other instructors will have the homework posted so that they post a couple of problems each day and those are due the following. Um, I prefer to just post one weekly assignment and then you need to pace yourselves and work on it throughout the week and it'll be based on the lecture material that we cover throughout the week. All right, so um, let's, let's talk about the first thing. Let's uh, Look at the lecture, the uh, syllabus, real quick, and I'm just going to go through these a little faster than normal because you have them and you have the ability to read them yourself. So let me go and find that. All right, so here's the syllabus, and real quickly, my office hours most important thing. Uh, they'll be virtual the first couple of weeks. The uh, there if there, I'm my normal office when it's not virtual will be in 92MA109, which is the trailers behind building 13. The uh, um, uh, feel free to you know come by, ask questions. If we have a lot of people, we might overflow into the conference room there. Um, I tend to, from talking to other people that teach this class, it tends to be quite a few people in office hours because the material is a little more difficult. The book. I am pulling problems from the 12th edition of, of the Beer Johnson book that you're probably familiar with. Now, because I'm not, I'm not gonna assign homework, just say do problems, this and this, I'm actually going to put the problems onto paper so that you'll have the problem itself. And the homework one is actually already posted if you had a chance to look at it. And uh, so you don't really need the latest edition if you don't want to shell out the $200 for it. Uh, the material from the 11th or the 10th is probably fine. I, actually from the seventh forward, but you're probably, if you already, you probably already have the book from Statics, then whatever edition you have is fine. Uh, if you rented it or whatever, um, and you need a book, then you, know, you can get the 12th. Uh, that's the newest one, but essentially the theory and everything is, is identical to the 11th and probably the 10th. And before that, it's probably harder to find a book that old, but that's what they are. So in terms of grading, it's a little different than I did in statics. I've gotten rid of the quizzes. There's reasons for that um, I won't go into, but uh, we're going to have two midterms because the amount of material and the, and the uh, diversity of the material is much different than statics. And so uh, it, it warranted having two exams so that uh, I felt one midterm would be too much to try to pile onto one idea or one uh, 50 minute exam. Homework, I've raised the, the point value from last quarter. It's now worth 20% of your grade. So each assignment is essentially two and a half percent of your grade. And then our finals 40%. So uh, homework, do your homework, 
uh, midterms. We'll talk more about those when we get to them. Common final, Monday, uh, 7 to 10 p.m. Common final, finals week. So that date's already set. So Monday finals week. So can't don't say I didn't tell you. So don't plan on any trips. Don't plan on any early spring break leaving because that's the day of the test. In terms of uh, grading, I use plus minus. Um, the class average, well, I haven't taught this one before, but typically a class average is 2.2 or 2.4. You've probably heard that there's a high failure rate of this class. That's not my philosophy. Um, I hope my goal is for everyone to pass and do well. I don't like to fail people. So I also expect you're not going to be absolute experts in the material after one quarter of taking it. Okay, otherwise that's just general information you can read on your own. Okay, so I want to look at the course outline real quick. Um, and where's it back? What? Where's that course, that pesky course outline? Ah, there it is. Sorry about that. So here's the course outline. This is the tentative. Again, um, having not taught it before, it's hard to gauge how much time I need to spend on these topics. I have an idea of how much I have to cover uh, based on the department. They want me to cover chapters 11, 12, 13, um, 14, 15, and 16, and 17. And it sounds like a lot, but um, some of the parts will, you know, will only do part of the chapters, but that's essentially, there's a, quite a bit of material. And so I've tried to break it down as best I can, but this will be approximately what we'll be doing each, each uh, lecture. You'll notice that the exams I've already written in, the first one is on uh, the 28th of January, and the second one is on the 25th of February. And so those are fixed dates for the tests. Uh, we do have a holiday coming up the third week, so we will meet Tuesday and Wednesday. So that'll be our first live lecture. That'll be on Tuesday, and then we'll meet again on Wednesday. All right, so far so good. If you have questions, feel free to blurt them out. Um, but otherwise, I'm sure that you'll uh, figure things out as we go, and, and uh, you can always ask me more in, in office hours. So going back to this. All right, so kind of gone over this so we can go there. All right, so let's jump into the lecture portion. Now, uh, I won't take roll um, yet. If you are trying to add the class, uh, go ahead and email me. If there's a way I can get you in, I will. Um, I know it's difficult online, but uh, it, at this point, it doesn't do me any good to take role just because people come and go. And so I'm not going to deal with that at this point. All right. So the very beginning of the, the, uh, of the book talks about Newton's three laws. I'm sure you're familiar with them from when you took physics. The uh, first law, um, basically, uh, it's the law of inertia. Things in motion stay in motion. Things at rest stay in rest. And then the second law, F equals MA, we'll be doing a lot of that uh, in a sense is that whereas in statics, everything, all the forces sum to zero, now all the forces are gonna sum to MA. And then for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now we're talking, the, the class is broken into two pieces, kinematics and kinetics. And so the difference between the two is in kinematics, we're really looking at uh, the velocity and, and motion of an object, but without reference to what caused it. So we're just saying a body is accelerated given this, this speed, this, this uh, position, this acceleration, but we don't care how it got there. And so we'll be dealing with just uh, uh, bodies, maybe free fall um, objects that are accelerated by some unknown um, uh, force. Then that'll be essentially the first three chapters that we'll talk about. And then we'll go into kinetics. And that'll be more about how forces act on a body. And so that's more like statics in that we're looking at what how forces affect the motion of a body uh, and how they're how we essentially that'll be the focus of when we really get into uh, free body diagrams and uh, force acceleration diagrams. And we'll discuss those at length when we get to that point. Now, in terms of 
particle kinetics. We have the two that we're going to start with is rectilinear motion, and that's the easiest. That's just basically motion in a straight line. So that's the easiest motion to deal with. And then we'll have curvilinear motion. So that'll be motion with position, velocity, and acceleration. And so that will deal with it on a curved line in two or three dimensions. And we'll be dealing primarily with two dimensions to start because this stuff does get complicated and I'd rather keep it as simple as possible until you guys get your get grounded in the information. Now, um, there are a couple things that I, if I usually like to write on, on a board and explain things. So I'm going to do that with my document camera. Uh, the, the document camera uh, hopefully will cooperate. It's been having issues with uh, focus, but let me go ahead and change to that. There you go. So hopefully you can see my sheet now. Now, we will be, one of the things is uh, at the beginning, of statics, you may recall we talked about units and what unit systems we'll be using. Now, in this class, we'll be doing essentially the same, it'll be the same idea. Um, our unit systems will be, let's just get this to show. Sorry, I'm trying to get this so I can actually see my screen. There we go, much better. Um, and so our systems of units, and I know this hopefully will stay in focus, we have length, time, force, mass. And so this stuff is, is just like before, SI units, we'll use meter, second, newton, kilogram, English, US, foot, second, pound, and mass is slug. Um, we're not going to really deal with the slug so much. You may remember these um, definitions. We know a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. A pound force is one slug foot per second squared or 32.174 pound mass per feet per second squared. And if you've had 236 or, or in 236, this should look quite familiar. Um, Thorncroft beat this into your guys' head. And so, but so we won't be doing much with slugs. We'll assume for our class that a pound force is anytime you see a pound force, if you see a pound, that equals a pound force. We're not gonna deal with pound mass. The other thing are significant figures. When you're dealing with significant figures, um, uh, you can keep as many as you want for intermediary calculations, but when you get your final answer, you should use three sig figs for um, a number. So for example, it's three sig figs, for a number that starts the two through a nine. So if I have 237,001 newtons, then that's going to be 237 kilonewtons. Uh, if I had a number that starts with the one instead of a two through a nine, like say 1,453.6, then I would just simply round that to be 1,000. 454 in my final answer, or 1.454 kilonewtons, if that were newtons. The idea being that um, you have four significant figures because it leads with a one. Here, you only have three significant figures that leads with a two through a nine, okay? And that's just the standard that we've used uh, in, in statics and some in your other, if you're an ME, it'll be in your other classes also. So that's, that's all you need for that. Uh, now, there are some definitions that we'll go through. And one of the things is we know that acceleration, you're gonna be given a lot of time, acceleration will equal a function of time. And so, if you remember from physics that A is equal to the first derivative of dv dt. So position 
it, the, the direct derivative of position versus time is, is velocity and the position in the derivative of velocity versus time is acceleration. And so we can also write this as dv equals a dt. And so in some of the calculations you'll do, you'll want to separate those out like that. And you'll end up in order to solve, you'll end up with something that looks like this. That's a bad integral, it's like a big S. You'll end up with dv from v naught to v equals the integral of zero to t um, some function of time. So this will be acceleration as a function of time. All right. And so that's how you'll be able to solve for that. And I'll do an example before we're done with the hour to explain that. This, uh, this is pretty much right out of physics 144, if you took it at poly. Uh, really not that much different than that. Um, we also have velocity. We know that velocity is equal to dx dt. And so we can also write that as dx equals v dt. And then that way, if you have, if you're given a function that you can integrate from zero, from x naught to x final dx, and that's going to equal the integral of, of t naught to t final of dt. And again, depends on what function you have that you, that you have put in there. All right. Now, one of the relationships that you will see is the idea that if you have, we know that um, A, make sure this is straight. I'm sorry, let me write this again. Hold on. So we know that V equals dx dt, and we know that A equals dv dt. And those are just the relationships that we learn in physics. So it turns out, though, that we can divide, we can solve, and we can eliminate the dt. And what we end up with is if we say dx dt divided by dv dt, that's going to be the same as V over A. And so the DTs cancel. And so if we rearrange this, we get A equals DV DX times V. This is a very important relationship that you'll be using in some of your calculations. It'll help you solve uh, when you're just given function, the velocity is a function of position. And if you need to understand what acceleration is. Uh, so we know that if we, if we look at we think of just simple rectilinear motion, then Let's say, for example, that we have a particle moving on straight line. So we're given that as x of t, x is a function of t, is equal to 3t cubed plus 6t squared plus 12 t plus 4. So most of the time t is going to be in seconds, but so this allows us, if we know the time, it allows us to know the position wherever it might be. Uh, we know that velocity is defined as the limit as t goes to 0 of the change in position with respect to change in time or we can say that V equals dV dx. So if we take dV dx 
of our function up here. Sorry, make sure that's on the screen. Then we end up with velocity equal to 9t squared plus 12t plus 12. I'm sorry, plus, uh, yeah, 12t. Okay. And then we know that in, we can take this, and we'll, and we'll do an example where we actually do more with it than just take the derivative. But we also know that for instantaneous acceleration, that A equals the limit of delta T going to zero of delta V over delta T. And so we know that A equals dV dt, or A equals the second derivative dx dt. OK? And so for our function that we have here, if we take the second derivative of that, we know that we get an acceleration then equal to 18t plus 12. All right. Now this is a, this is covered in your in your book in the very beginning part of it, and I would there's a table in there which I'm going to show you. Let's let's go do that right now. That summarizes these relationships. So here we can see dvdt equals a is a function of t, which you knew, uh, and then we have. A is, so you can have acceleration as a function of time, as a function of position, or as a function of velocity. And so notice that uh, for each situation, you have a slightly different variation of how you're going to deal with your integral. Okay. But this last one here, the, the V dV dx equals A, that's the one that we showed when you divide um, dv dt and dx dt to get this relationship. So anyway, um, you know, with just showing you this isn't, isn't that helpful, I don't think. And, and what I would find is that the most helpful for classes like this is to actually do real examples. And so as far as, uh, there's not gonna be a lot of theory in this class. I mean, I will try to present the basics as best I can. Uh, the reading of the book I'll, I'll, um, isn't, I don't find it really super helpful to just curl up with the book and read it like a nice novel. Uh, some of the examples in there are good, but some of the explanations are, are a little convoluted. And so it's, uh, I'm tr what I'm trying to do with this class is, because I know it's challenging, is to try to break it down into bite-sized pieces where we have specific types of problems that we can solve and using a certain method. And that just takes time. So, all right. So let's look at a um, theoretical question. So here we have two cars, A and B, racing each other down a straight road. And so what we see here is the position of each car is a function of time. And so we wanna decide which of these statements are correct. So if we look at this, we look at the two. Now, one of the things we notice right off the bat is that position versus time. You'll notice that the car A has a straight line. So you can uh, infer from that that the acceleration uh, has to be zero, right? Because you have a linear line. And so if you take the second derivative of the position, you're going to get zero. So there's no acceleration there, whereas car B does have a um, acceleration as a function of time based on its higher order um, uh, function for its position. So if we look at the, two, the, the possibilities, A, at time T2, both cars have traveled the same distance. Well, we can see that's not true because the position of B is higher than the position of A. So that one's pretty easy to say, no, that's not true. And then there's B. And with B, it says at time T1, 
both cars have the same speed. And so, well, we can't say that's really true either because the slope at time T1 would have to be the same. And so just because they cross doesn't mean they have the same speed. So B is also not correct. Um, C says both cars have the same speed at some time T less than T1. What do you think about that one? Does that one seem true? Probably is because at some point the slope of B is the same as the slope of A. So C is, is true, all right? Then we look at, at D. Both cars have the same acceleration at some time. So we know that the acceleration of A is zero, but we know from the shape of B that that acceleration is not zero. So we know that D can't be true. And then lastly, we have E. Both cars have the same acceleration at some time between T1 and T2. And so we know that the acceleration of A is zero, but we also know that if you take the second derivative of position versus time, the inflection point occurs somewhere between T1 and T2. So that inflection point pretty close to the top um, is where the slope is zero. And so therefore they both have an acceleration of zero. So E is also correct. So C and E work. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Any questions on that? Okay, good. All right, let's do another example. So this one here, we're actually going to do, um, we're gonna use this equation that we have and we're actually gonna solve something with it. Okay, so we have, we're given a motion of a particle is defined as x equals t cubed plus 6t squared plus 9t plus 5. So I'm going to go ahead really quickly and write that down. You should write that down too. And so we know x is in feet, t is in seconds. All right. And so A, we want to know velocity. I'm sorry, when does velocity equal zero? When does V equal zero? And what is S acceleration and total? distance at t equals five seconds. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the other camera. And so here we are. Uh, all right, so there's our function, all right. So we know that V equals dV dt. I'm sorry, sorry, dx dt. And of course, acceleration is equal to dv dt. So we can go ahead then, and we know that v is going to be equal if we take dx dt of the velocity, we get v equals 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And we get acceleration is equal to 6t minus 12. All right. So for velocity, notice that um, we can factor this. And if we do, we get 3 times t minus 1 times t minus 3 equals 0. All right. And so uh, now we can say that we know that at t equals 1 and t equals 3, that velocity is 0. Okay? So that's the first part of that. And then we're going to need to, we'll need that when we come back to it. 
All right. So when is velocity equal zero? So that's what we want to know. So we know it's a t time at one and time at three. All right. Any questions? Make sense? Okay. So part. I had a question. How did you get negative twelve instead of positive twelve? Six t three t squared. Did I did I write it wrong? I had three t squared minus twelve t. Was it plus in the first? Did I write it backwards? Did I write it backwards. Oh, this should be minus. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, the negative sign was in the original, but not in that. There we go. Question. Are we always assuming that time starts at zero? So if you get a negative result in your factor, you just disregard it? Depending on what it's asking, but usually yes. It's uh, it, We'll see that more when we do, um, there's not a lot of factoring, but we'll be doing a lot of quadratic equations. And so we will get two times often, and especially when you're doing projectile motion, then we know that we had a negative time. Obviously we disregard that. Uh, if, if we have two positive times, then that, uh, especially if you're doing projectile motion with angles, you know that that's dependent on the angle in which the projectile was launched. But uh, I guess to answer your question is, um, most of the time, I, I haven't seen negative times unless they're in roots, and then you just get rid of them. Okay, so anything else? All right, so then we have B. Um, we want to know in part in part A and B. So I should have not wrote B. What is I should have separated that line. And then this was part A. Perils of writing. So now we have part B. So now we want to know what is the position at t equals five seconds. All right. So that's easy. We can plug that into our position, and we know it's going to be five cubed minus six times five squared plus nine times five plus five. And that equals my x. So x equals 25 feet at t equals five seconds. Okay. And then we're asked to find what is the acceleration. Acceleration at T equals five seconds. And so we have, we know that A equals six T minus 12 or A equals six times five minus 12 and do the complicated math and we get A equals 18 feet per second squared. All right. So there's that. And then the last one, it wants to know what is the total distance traveled? And so we know that the uh, object has essentially zero velocity at one and three. So we can do it. There's different ways to do it, but I find because there's so few uh, times, we basically have to go through one through five. We can just plug in one second, two second, three second, four and five into our position um, equation. So if we do that, we get at one second, we get nine feet. And that's just, again, plugging in one into this. So one second, we get nine feet, two seconds, we essentially have um, seven feet. And then at three seconds, we end up with five feet, if we plug that in. And then at four seconds, we have another nine feet. And then um, the, and then the final is, at five seconds, which we already calculated was 25. Now, this is not the actual distance it went, but this is where it physically is. So if you think about um, from zero to one, because 
we know that uh, if we plug in zero into this equation here, our initial x at zero is five. So we started at five feet. So if we think about it, we have um, nine feet. So the initial at t equals zero, we're at five feet. We go to nine feet, so that's a total distance of four, right? And then from one second to two second, we go from nine to seven, so that's a distance of two. And then we go from two to three, um, we go from seven to five, so that's another two feet. And then from three to four, we go from five to nine, which is four feet. And then lastly, at five, we know that we go a total of 16 feet because that's a 25, so nine to 25. So actually when we add it all up, the total is 28 feet, all right? So it's not, I don't think it's, it's not really, uh, uh, challenging from the math end. It's just keeping track of all this. And again, I realize it may have been a few quarters since you guys took physics. So after you do a couple of these and refresh, you should they should be pretty straightforward. Now, one of the, one of the disadvantages of dynamics is there's so many different topics we have to cover is we really don't dwell on one topic too much and it does build on itself. So there's only one or two problems that you'll do with this type of uh, using these functions to start with. And then we'll uh, move on to something slightly different. But I want to show you another example too. It's a 10 to two. So I want to get that example done before um, because I think it's a, it's a good one that will relate to the homework. Before I go, any questions on this one? Okay. So let me go ahead and uh, go back to the screen. All right. Now this is another uh, conceptual example that, and if you and I would I would put it to you to think what is it going to be. Um, a bus travels 100 miles between A and B at 50, then another 100 from B to C at 70. So the so the um, the answer that might seem obvious or may think is 60, but it's not 60. Um, so it turns out that if you take the, if you figure out how long it took to get from A to B, if you're going 100 miles at 50, that's going to be two hours, right? If you go from B to C, then if you take 100 divided by 70, you get about 1.54. So the total time to go from A to C is about 3.54 um, hours. So if you take 200 miles and divide it by the total time, 3.54, you get roughly, I think, 58, 57 miles per hour. So your answer is less than 60, okay? So that's the idea behind that problem there. All right, I did wanna to get to this one. So, uh, so here we have um, the, an airstream that the air is, is going out a, a heating duct and we're given its velocity we're as a function of position. And so what we wanna do is we want to solve for the acceleration of the air when it's at two meters away from the duct and we assume the duct is zero. That's the position zero. And the time required for the air to flow from x equals one meter to x equals three meters. So is anyone uh, muted? Is everyone muted? Because I hear some talking in the back. Thanks. OK, so let's look at this one. All right, so we know that. Let's, and so I think that it's possible if I minimize this. Now, can you see my camera also? Can you switch between my camera and this? So I can leave it up there and I can keep typing. Okay, good. Let me know if you can't, because that's that way 
um, I don't want to take that away. All right, so we know that velocity in this case is a function of position, right? That's what we're given. We're not given as a function of time, we're given as a function of position. And we know that our velocity function is equal to 0 0.18 V initial divided by X. And we're given that V initial is equal to 3.6 meters per second. All right. So let's look at A, acceleration. All right. So acceleration, we know A equals dV dx times V. And remember, that was a um, equation that we that was an equation that we derived uh, a few minutes ago. So therefore, dv dx equals negative zero point one eight v naught over x squared. All right. And that's uh and so how did I how did I get that? I had I took dv dx of this and then um and then I plug that in here and I get dv dx times v gives me dv dx is negative point zero v dot squared and it's negative. Okay. All right. So we know then that if we take a um, a equals acceleration then is going to equal 0 0.18 v naught over x minus 0 0.18 v naught over x squared. And so or we can rewrite this as A equals 0 0.324 V naught squared over X cubed. All right. And so now we can say at X equals two meters, we get uh, we plug in two into here, and we know our velocity initial is 3.1 or 3.6. So we have 0 0.324 times 3.6 divided by two cubed. And we get acceleration is equal to, and that's, and that's negative, sorry, um, negative 0. 0.0525 meters per second squared. All right. So there's our first answer. Okay. So that's just uh, some simple rearrangement of the initial equation. And voila, we have it. So now we have that. And so we want to look at second part, part B. And let me know if the screen runs off because I can't. I'm looking at the looking at the paper, so if it suddenly disappears, let me hold that back. Does everyone get that? Should it be x squared in the denominator, where it says acceleration equals negative point three two four? No, it's x cubed. It's back at that. Yeah, because you're multiplying. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. This isn't minus. This is you're multiplying this. Apologize that. Yeah. So this is multiplied. So you point okay, one eight. Yeah, V naught times X times. That. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, my chicken scratches kind of get in the way. That's why I wish I had a big board. There we go. All right. So um, now we have B. Now part B says the time required for the air to flow from X equals one to X equals three. And so if we look at the equation, we have V equals dx dt 
And so um, we know that that's again equal to 0 0.18 V naught over X. And so we take, um, we write, then we can rewrite that as 0 0.18 V naught DT equals x dx. So all we did was we took this equation here. We know our velocity is that. So we said that 0 0.18 um, equals that and swapped them around. So I should what I should have drawn it is 0.01 v naught over x equals dx dt. There we go. So we have those two now. And so we can integrate each one from one to three, and this one from just zero to t. And if we do that, if we do that, we end up with um, 0 0.18 v naught times t. And then that's going to just equal to um, x. I'm sorry, not too quick. That's just going to equal to x squared over 2 evaluated from 1 to 3. And so if we go ahead and solve for that and plug it in, we end up with 0.18 times v naught, which is we know is. 3.6, and then that's going to equal one half of nine minus one. And so we end up with essentially t equal to 6.17 seconds. All right. So I think that was a good start for the day. Um, I apologize, it was a little clunky. It'll take me a little bit to get used to this format. I, I promise you once we're in the classroom, it'll be a lot smoother. And, uh, but hopefully that gives you a kind of a sense of the first few um, sections of chapter 11. Uh, there, I probably will post additional examples uh, where I just uh, work out examples that I think are of interest and because we don't have enough time in 50 minutes to cover them and then I will just go ahead and put them up on canvas for your review if that if you think that would be helpful so. All right, well I think we're out of time, um, thank you everyone for coming, I will see you here same place on Wednesday or I will be in office hours if you have any questions all right you have a good day and thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 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 Thanks.